93, 93rd message in a series on the person and work of Christ. And we are preaching on Christ in the Old Testament or the gospel according to the scriptures. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, that the gospel he preached of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was according to the scriptures. We're trying now to find what scriptures in the Old Testament preached the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And our message tonight is in probably one of the most glorious passages of the Old Testament concerning the gospel, and that is the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Let me read verses 1 through 12. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither with any deceit in his mouth, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. One of the most fascinating things about this chapter is that it was written 700 years before Jesus came to earth. 750 years, practically, before Jesus died. And yet it reads as though the man who wrote it was an eyewitness of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And more than that, it was written as though the man who wrote it not only saw the death, burial, and resurrection, but understood God's purpose and God's intent in it. Yet Isaiah lived seven centuries before the star ever came and stood over Bethlehem. Seven centuries before Mary ever gave birth that night to the baby Jesus' body, that Christ, the Son of God, might inhabit it and indwell it. Seven centuries before he walked the shores of Galilee or went the lonely path to Gethsemane and Calvary, Isaiah seemed to see the coming death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus through the eyes of prophecy and through the eyes of faith. And he wrote about it in the most exacting manner, written almost as though he had sat at the feet of the Apostle Paul and had heard Paul expound and explain the glories of the cross. Isaiah saw it. There can be no doubt in any Bible uh, readers, heart or mind, that the 53rd chapter of Isaiah definitely deals with Jesus. There are three passages in the New Testament which absolutely verify this. You need not turn to them, but in 1 Peter, 
the Apostle Peter, writing years after the resurrection of Christ, quotes from the 7th, 8th, and ninth verses of this chapter and ascribes them to Jesus. He says no guile was found in his mouth, no deceit. He speaks of him opening not his mouth and being led forth from judgment. And he ascribes Isaiah 53 to the happenings of the Lord's life in his trial and in his execution. John the Baptist, before the cross, standing on the shores of Jordan, saw Jesus walking one day, and he cried out to his followers, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Now there are two interesting things about that statement by John. First of all, John had never seen the Lord Jesus to recognize him before. But he did know God's anointed Son and suffering Savior from the Old Testament Scriptures. If you'll study carefully the events leading up to John's statement, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world, and the statements following that immediately, you will see that John himself testifies after this statement that he himself didn't know who Jesus was until the one who sent him, that is John, to baptize and preach, revealing to him by the Spirit coming down upon him in the river Jordan in his baptism. Now let me straighten that out a little bit for you. John knew the suffering Lamb of God from the Scriptures. He didn't know Jesus of Nazareth was that suffering Lamb until the day he baptized him, which was almost the same time he cried out, Behold the Lamb of God. That day, he said, he knew that Jesus of Nazareth was the Old Testament Christ, and he knew that he was slated to be God's Lamb. Now, I wonder today, as I was studying for this message, what passage of Scripture revealed to John the nature of of the Lamb. It had to be Isaiah. John took his very commission from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, the third to the fifth verses, is the very place in the Old Testament Scriptures that John the Baptist felt he had been called of God. Make straight paths and make straight the way of the Lord. And he quotes three verses out of Isaiah 40 and gives them as his commission from the Word of God. I take it then that John was a student of the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah, he had found his own calling of God. It was through the Scriptures, and I'm thankful for that, that God called John the Baptist. He saw and read and believed and heard the call of God in the Word. And that is still the way men are called. Men are called by seeing in the Word of God the blessed privileges and responsibilities that belong to us in our newfound salvation in Jesus Christ, made ministers of reconciliation, having had committed unto us the Word of Reconciliation. Men become convicted by those words and believe that God has indeed called them and sent them out to minister that message of reconciliation. And John found his call in the 40th chapter of Isaiah, and undoubtedly he had in his own mind and in the eye of the heart a wonderful portrait of God's Son, what he would do when he came and what he would be. And one day when Jesus came to be baptized, God revealed to John, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And apparently all of it came into focus in John's mind and heart. And so he cried out, Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Then there is a third passage in the New Testament that verifies Jesus as the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. It is that passage in Acts 8 when the Ethiopian eunuch was coming back from Jerusalem 
on his way home to Africa riding along in his chariot. And standing along the road was Philip the Evangelist. The eunuch is reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he's reading this very passage in Isaiah that tells about him as a lamb being led to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so openeth not his mouth. The eunuch had been reading the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, and the Spirit of God was dealing with him. The Spirit of God was endeavoring to make Jesus known to him through the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, and the chariot stopped, and he invited Philip to get up into the chariot, and when Philip saw that he was reading from the scroll of Isaiah, he said, Do you understand what you're reading? which means that it's possible to read this chapter and not understand that Jesus fulfilled it. So he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, How can I accept some man teach me? And so it says that Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He didn't preach Isaiah's suffering servant. He preached Jesus. He told this eunuch that these things were written about Jesus. We don't have Philip's message recorded, excepting that he preached Jesus from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, but he so expounded the gospel to the eunuch from that chapter of Old Testament scripture that the eunuch believed and the eunuch was saved. And, to believe, and he believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now I've often wondered why the Lord didn't let us have Philip's message. I'd love to have read that message, how he expounded and opened this chapter to the eunuch as they traveled along that bumpy road. But it was kept from us from some good reason. And I wondered what Philip told the eunuch about Jesus. Well, I came up with three things today that I want to pass on to you that I'm sure he must have told the eunuch from this chapter. He told him, first of all, that Jesus came into the world to be a sin bearer. And I know it may sound like repetition to keep saying it over and over again, but Paul said it over and over again. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The world itself wouldn't contain the books that have been written about the purpose of Jesus' life. Every philosopher from the day he was crucified, has taken upon himself to explain in some manner the mysterious appearance of this man upon a state of time. Philosophers must explain his appearance because he remains as the greatest wonder and miracle of human history. Even though they do not believe in him, they must endeavor to explain him. Volumes have been written, thousands and thousands of volumes, to explain who Jesus was, why he came, what he did, and what he accomplished, and what the lessons are to be learned from his appearance. But Paul says, plainly and simply, that the entire purpose of his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, was simply to save sinners. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, the angel said, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus announced it in his own ministry, and he said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. In the Gospel of John, the third chapter, it is written that God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that, that is, he sent his Son into the world that men might be saved. 
He came into this world to seek and to save the lost. That doesn't mean to seek them out where they were geographically. It means that he came to seek them through the death, burial, and resurrection at the cross of Calvary. I'm sure that Philip must have told the eunuch that the first thing you must know about Jesus, he had heard about Jesus in Jerusalem, but I grant that he had never heard what Philip told him. For had he heard what Philip told him, he would have been saved in Jerusalem, not in that chariot. Philip told him, this is what you must first learn about Jesus. He came into the world to be a sin bearer. This eunuch was obviously a Jewish proselyte. He must have been to have traveled 600 miles one way to Jerusalem to keep the feast and to worship in the temple and to read and study the Old Testament scriptures and to be under the influence of Judaism as such. So undoubtedly he believed in the Christ. He believed that one day God would send his son he believed that son would reign and fulfill the promises made to David. He believed that righteousness would come to the earth again through this king of righteousness. But he had never learned of Jerusalem that Jesus is that Christ and that he came into the human race to bear the sin of the world away. And this is what that eunuch heard from the mouth of Philip. Jesus came to be a sin bearer. In the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, many statements are made to this effect. Notice, first of all, in verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs. The word grief in that fourth verse means our sorrow. It means whatever rubs or wears us. This is the word in the original Hebrew, to rub or to wear or to cause sorrow. Notice now in verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and he carried our sorrow. The word sorrows means anything that causes us pain. In verse 11, he shall bear their iniquities. The word iniquities means moral perverseness, filth, evil. Same word is used in verse 6 where it says the Lord laid on him the iniquity, the moral perverseness, the filth, and the evil of us all. In verse 12, he bare the sin of many. This word in the original means the nature of sin, the guilt and penalty of Adam's nature. Now notice three times, verse 4, 11, and 12, Isaiah speaks of him as a sin bearer. He bears our iniquities, he bears our sins, he bears our sorrows, and he bears our griefs. Where he says carried, he uses a word which refers to a beast of burden. So like a beast of burden, the Lord Jesus came into this world to carry our griefs, our sorrows, our iniquities, and our sins. The word born has many definitions, that is, shades of definition. Listen to some of them. It means accepted, to live. It means to suffer, to carry away, to contain, to desire, to ease, to forgive, to wear like a garment, and to take away. Now put all of these things together that Isaiah said, and here is what we have about Jesus. Jesus came to accept our sins and our iniquities, our griefs and our sorrows. He came to lift our griefs, our sorrows, our iniquities, and our sins. He came to suffer for our sin, our iniquities, our griefs, and our sorrows. 
He came to carry them away. He came to contain them. He came to ease them, to forgive them, to take them away. He desired them, and he wore them like a tattered gun. We complain so much about so little. We're always talking about the things that rub us and weary us and make us tired. We say it's about to wear me out. You say it rubs me the wrong way. You say it grieves me, it causes me pain. Everything in this life that causes man pain, the thorns and the thistles and the briars and the sweat of the face, it was all a promise of the curse of sin in Genesis. All of these things the Lord Jesus came and accepted in our behalf. He lived a million human lives in one. He had laid upon him the sum total of all of the grief and sorrow in the human race. We think we have trouble. He had laid upon him the sum total of every sorrow and every grief that human hearts have ever known since the day of Adam. You say, well, it must have killed him. No, had it been a man, it would have killed him. But he was God in the flesh. There are times when every human being feels like he'd like to retire from the human race. There are times when every human being says, life is so short and the sorrow of my heart is so great that I can't stand this constant involvement in other people's lives, adding to my sorrow, adding to my grief, causing me to be rubbed and worn even more than my own personal life does. You follow me? Everybody comes to that place where you just like to say, you keep your griefs and your sorrows, I have enough to handle myself. The longer we live in this life, the more we become involved in the lives of others, don't we? Our children, then our grandchildren, and then our great-grandchildren, our neighbors and our friends, the saved and the unsaved. The longer we stay, the more our lives are involved in a complicated and complex manner. When we were young, we lived for ourselves. We answered to ourselves and coped with our own problems, didn't do much about bearing the problems of others. But as we went on, life became more complicated, and our natural involvement in family, in the community, and among friends caused our hearts to be weighted heavier and heavier with the trials and the cares of others. How do you suppose the Lord Jesus must have felt when he was involved in the life of every man, every woman, and every boy, and every girl who ever lived. From the time he came into the human race, he began to sense the grief and the sorrow of the whole race. Not a few, the whole race. Faith makes me to believe that he foresaw the grief and sorrow of my heart and bore it all. Faith makes me to believe that everything that rubs me and grieves me and tires me and wearies me, he took the sharp edge of it long before I was ever born, for he carried it about upon himself like a beast of burden, accepting it from God as his rightful involvement with the human race, to say nothing of the sin and the iniquity of us all that was laid upon him. The sorrows and griefs are one thing, but to think that the moral perverseness, the filth of the human race, the sum and substance of all evil conceived in the hearts of men, was also laid upon him like a beast of burden. He was acquainted with our grief personally, there are sorrows like a beast of burden, and upon that heavily laden heart 
when he went to the cross of Calvary, God laid the sins and the iniquities of us all. Not only the moral perverseness, the filth, and the evil deeds and thoughts and words of the race, but he laid on him the sin nature, the guilt of it and the penalty of it. Faith again makes me to believe that when the Lord Jesus died, when he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I personally believe that in that cry he knew what it meant to suffer the guilt and the penalty of the sin nature and to experience the weight of the perverseness, moral perverseness, the evil, the filth of the human race, as well as be worn out and rubbed thin by the griefs and sorrow of a dying people. <clears throat> this was a quote, as you know, my God, my God, from the 22nd Psalm. And it is the first verse of that psalm. And there is more told us in the 22nd Psalm than there is in the 19th of John or in the Gospel of Matthew where we hear him cry. In the 22nd Psalm, he starts out crying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then what follows is apparently the meditation of his own heart. He reasons that he was forsaken because God is holy. And yet he is astounded, for he said, Our fathers before me trusted in you, and you never failed them. Now, why have you let me die? Because thou art holy. And as a holy God, he saw Jesus bearing the sin and iniquities and griefs and sorrows of the human race. And because he was holy, he had to turn his back upon him, forsake him in that lost condition, and pour out upon him the accumulated wrath and penalty due to the race for their sin and iniquity. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He came into the race to be a sin bearer. That's what he came for. This is what John the Baptist saw in him in Isaiah's prophecy. And when he knew that Jesus was God's Christ, he pointed to him. They all thought of him as a prophet then. The only reputation he had up to that point was of an itinerant prophet, a teacher, a preacher of some new doctrine. But John said, look at him. I'll tell you who he is. It's God's land. God's land. And as though someone would said, what will he do? John answers, he will take away the sin of the world. The second thing Philip must have told that uni was that as the sin bearer, he came to suffer. Human words fail at this chapter. When you go to speak of the sufferings of Christ, there are no words that can frame what he suffered. I was thinking today, we always think of the nails and the spear and the crown. We think of all of those physical sufferings of the Lord, and they are not to be depreciated in any way. But today, somehow, I was thoughtful about the internal sufferings of the Lord. I thought of his sufferings that began at birth when he willfully accepted the limitations of a human appearance, when he confined his tremendous power to the form of a man, when he willingly received from human beings the rebuke and the hatred 
and the rejection that he suffered for. He was rejected of men. He was a man of sorrow. He was a man despised and esteemed not. And the Jews looked upon him as a man who had been under the hand and the curse of God. It says so in this chapter. That was the reputation he had, was a man that even God had cursed. They talked about him. The psalmists, many of them prophesying of the coming Savior, spoke of the long hours of the night when he would weep upon his bed, for none understood him. When he was reviled in the very house of his mother, and his brethren rejected him and hated him. In the seventh of John, those despiteful words, not even his brethren believed in him. You hear the Lord Jesus crying through some of the Messianic Psalms, and one of those Psalms he cries out, when he chastised his soul, and when he put upon himself sackcloth and ashes, when he wept to God, when his heart was broken, he said men mocked him. He said the drunkards sat in the town gate and made up songs about him. He was the butt of every unkind and perhaps unclean story of the neighborhood and community gossip. He lived a life of rejection. Men despised the ground he walked on. And all of this time, as he endured their rejection, he was bearing and learning by intimate association in his own soul the sorrows and griefs of the whole human race, preparing himself for the time when God would lay on him the sins and the iniquities of that same race. I've often marveled at the patience of the Lord. He knew what was in all men. What compelled him was such loving patience to keep silent in the midst of such liars and thieves and evil men. He would turn his other cheek. Though he could call twelve legions of angels, he never called them. Though he could have rebuked men until they could never have answered again, he seldom did. He left them in their own lies, never encouraged them in their hatred, gave them no cause to hate him or despise him, and lived 33 years with a locked-in, tormented soul that no one will ever know but he and his father. I used to wonder what he went apart at night and spent a whole night time in prayer on the mountain for him. When I was first read the Bible, I used to think he went there to get instruction. But he said he knew what the Father had sent him to do. He heard everything while he was here on earth that was being said in heaven. He received everything that there was from the Father to receive. He had all knowledge. But I think that in those long times of prayer at night, while his disciples slept, and he would go alone by himself, into the mountains and there continue all night in prayer. Prayer is not all request. Prayer is not asking. Prayer is blessed fellowship. And perhaps the only cry that came from his lips during those prayer nights were, O oh, Father, you understand. And even so, Father, it hath pleased thee. He was a lonely man. And the inner sufferings alone must have been enough to consume him. But the inner sufferings were not all his sufferings. For he was wounded at an appropriate time for our transgression. And he was bruised for our iniquities. He was striped because of the chastisement of our peace. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And the eunuch must have learned that day from the mouth of Philip that Jesus not only was a sin bearer, but a sufferer because of the sin of the world. You know, there are five wounds. I think the medical profession classifies all wounds into five classes. 
This was an interesting discovery to me one day to find out that he bore in his own body each of those five different kinds of wounds. He was wounded by man with every conceivable wound that is known in the medical profession to the human body. The first type of wound is called a contooth wound, which is a black and blue wound. And the prophecies, as well as the fulfillment of those prophecies, verify the fact that Jesus was smitten with the fists of men. The game they played, for instance, in the army barracks before he was taken out to be executed. They blindfolded him. And then the soldiers took turns. They'd put the crown of thorns on him and given him a broken reed for a scepter. They had already lashed him with 39 lashes save one, or 40 lashes save one, and now they blindfolded him. And as the soldiers would pass around, perhaps in single file or in a circle, each one would spit in his face. And then they would take their fists and smite him in the face. And then they would cry, now prophesy and tell us who hit him. And the prophet Isaiah in the 52nd chapter describing the horrible punishment that the Lord Jesus took physically said that his appearance, his countenance, his face was so marred, so spoiled, so ruined by this treatment that he no longer resembled a human being. You ever see someone who had been beaten badly in the face? You would never have recognized them had you been their own brother. Eyes swollen shut, mouth all out of shape and swollen, nose flattened and bleeding, perhaps a jaw broken, teeth missing, cheeks swollen, black and blue. He was bruised, the prophet said. A conscious wound is a black and blue wound. It is caused by a terrible blow. And he was smitten by the fists of men. And never forget that your fists helped in that that night. The second type of a wound is a laceration wound. This was caused by the lash, striped for the chastisement of our peace. Forty lashes, save one, lacerated the back and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a perforation wound. The perforation wound was suffered the day they crowned him with the crown of thorns, perforated his brow with sharp thorns as long as a man's finger, as sharp as a needle. That's a penetration wound. The perforation wound is the separation of the flesh. And this took place when they drove the nails through his hands and the nails through his feet. And the last wound, according to the medic, is an internal wound. And the internal wound was caused that day when the soldier came by with his spear and pierced his side. But more than that, he broke his great heart. The Lord Jesus at the hands of man suffered every wound that the human race could inflict upon him. And over and over in this chapter we are told he did it because of, on the account of, for or in the stead of, our sins, our iniquities, our griefs, and our sorrows. Not only was he wounded, he was bruised. The original says crushed. He was striped, and we are told that he was oppressed. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. The word afflicted means browbeat. The word oppressed, there are some word pictures in that one, listen to them. To oppress like men who drive an animal. An army in flight is said to be oppressed. An overtaxed workman is oppressed. A harassed debtor is oppressed. This is the word the Holy Spirit used with Jesus. He was oppressed. All through his life, 
He was like a driven and hunted animal. You ever see men hunted animals? You ever see a deer being hunted by men? Driven from every place of safety, out of every little bit of brush, uphill and downhill and through every ravine, never time to stop even for a drink of water, looking back over his shoulder for to stop his death. And wherever he stops, there are men to oppress him, to drive him on until they have captured him and killed him. So the prophet describes Jesus as a driven animal, driven by the race he came to save until they had driven him to Calvary, and there they slew him. He was oppressed like an army, an army in flight, like an army that has been engaged in battle with the enemy, and suddenly the tide has turned against them, and there is no hope, and they have abandoned their position. They are making a retreat, but on their heels comes the oppressing army, firing, shouting, screaming, for if they stop, now they must die. And Jesus is pictured as an army in flight, oppressed like an overtaxed workman. It comes from the way, same word used in the book of Exodus to describe the taskmaster down in Egypt. He was oppressed by the taskmasters of the human race, and driven like an harassed debtor to the cross of Calvary. And considering all of that, it must have been a great relief to him to die. The sin bearer must suffer. Now lastly, I think Philip told that eunuch that the sin bearer suffering would make satisfaction for God. Three times in the 53rd of Isaiah, and I want you to hear this because it's one of the most important things, the real offering for sin, the real price that was paid at Calvary, the real meaning of the atonement is given. Three times it says that the soul of the Lord was made an offering for sin. Now, if you don't think this is important, then I must enlighten you. The wounds in his body did not pay for our sin. They could not because the wages of sin is not physical pain. If that were true, then all of us could pay for our own sin, for sooner or later we suffer pain in the body. It was not the pains of dying that he was released from by God. Peter says it was the pains of death. Physical suffering and physical death do not pay the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death, but it is eternal death to the soul. It is separation from God of the man in outer darkness, in a place described as burning with fire, where the worm never dies and where the fire is never quenched. And Paul in his book of Hebrews says, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And in Revelation 20 it says that the judgment there will be a second death. That second death is the lake of fire. That second death is separation in hell. That second death will hear the sinner cry, My God, my God, why is thou forsaken? Three times, verses 10, 11, and 12, Isaiah says that Christ's soul was the offering. It was not his body, it was the soul. He offered up to God his own soul. He offered up to God the separation of himself in the sinner's place. He offered up to God his own sinless, holy, spotless person. 
to be banished from God in the place of the sinner. He offered himself to God without spot, to bear as the unblemished lamb the sins and the iniquities of us all into a wilderness place. He offered himself to God to take away the sin of the world. Do not forget this, brethren, that the price was the soul. In verse 10 it says, When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, in the place of sin, in the stead of sin, and in the stead of the sinner, Christ offered his soul. Now jump to verse 12. He hath poured out his soul unto death. That is, when he died physically, he poured out his soul unto another death. That death was a second death. How did he die? In verse 12, we're told he was numbered with what? Transgressors. Look at word transgressors up today. Oh, it's a good word. It means to revolt against uh, governmental authority and power. It means to be a rebel. It means to break away from authority. And here, sinners are described as rebels revolutionary, who had broken away from the authority of God, who had rebelled against him, who had revolted against him. And when Christ died at the cross, the moment he died, God counted him with the rebels, counted him with those who had revolted and those who had broken away. He counted him as the chief rebel the chief revolutionary, and saw in him the leader of a whole race of sinners, and vicariously did to him what was due to the whole race. Now, I wish you had the time to tell you the story fully of Absalom, but it would illustrate this beautifully. Absalom was David's son. And Absalom rebelled against his father, rebelled against the throne of his father, went out into his kingdom and stirred up rebellion and started a revolution that would have unseated David and did unseat him from his very throne. David was driven out of Jerusalem, heartbroken, with a double heartbreak. First, that he'd been dethroned that his kingdom was divided and torn by rebellion and strife. But the second heartbreak was worse than all. His own son was the leader of the rebellion. Now David is torn between two. He's torn between his integrity and his sense of justice as a king, his obligation to the people to restore peace to his kingdom. He's torn between his obligations as the king and his heart of love as a father. For Absalom was still his son, even though he had rebelled. And only God knows what a horrible and terrible hard decision it was for David to make when he gave Ahab the task of going out to slay Absalom. He said, take my arm. And whatever it takes, round him up. Put this rebellion down. Bring peace to the kingdom. But then his father heart overwhelmed him, and he said they had deal kindly with the boy. But there was no way to deal kindly with the boy. He was a rebel. He was a revolutionary. He had set himself to dethrone his father, to take from his hand the kingdom. <coughs> And when David's armies caught up with Absalom, faith, as the world would say, had already taken a hand, for he'd been caught in a great oath by his hair. And three darts were plunged into his heart. He was killed. Now, in a way, David was glad that he was dead. 
For David was the king of Israel, and now the rebellion was ended. The strife was ended. The division was ended. The revolution was over. The kingdom was restored to peace. David could return to Jerusalem and sit upon his throne with the integrity of that throne intact. But as a father, his son was dead and buried and went into the pit, the Bible says. And as a father, he went up on the battlements of the palace and he paced and they heard him in the night hours crying and weeping. And his cry was, Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. And some of the men that had risked their lives to bring peace to the kingdom were offended. He said, I don't understand it. The rebellion is put down and order has come back to the land. Peace is here. And he grieves. He should be rejoicing like the rest of us. But you see, David was both king and father. But the next day, David washed and shaved himself and came down and entered into the festivities. For that day, he was king. Now, so it was with God. It says here that even though Jesus had done no violence and no guile was found in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It says the Lord, Jehovah, God. For God is God, and he is also the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. As a father, he could never have been pleased to bruise his son. But as God, he was pleased. For he numbered him with the transgressors. And he saw him as the chief rebel. And poured out upon him his unmixed wrath due to all those who had rebelled against him. His father heart wept, Jesus, my Jesus, would God I had died for me. But as God, he was pleased that he had died. Why? <coughs> Dear friends, it's because the offering of his soul satisfied God. There's one other word I wanted to leave with you. It says in verse 12, numbered with the transgressors, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, I always thought before today that that meant that Jesus prayed for these transgressors in some way, and I always have been referred to that prayer on the cross, Father, forgive them not. They don't know what they do. But look this word intercessors up today, and oh, it's a fine word too. Listen to what it says. It means to come between. It means to lay upon. It means to fall upon with violence. And when the Lord Jesus died and offered his soul to God, he, the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ, came between the transgressors and God. And everything that belonged to transgressors fell upon him in that hour, was laid upon him in that hour, was counted to him as he was numbered with those transgressors. And verse 11 says that God would see the travail of his soul and would be satisfied. The word satisfied means sated, it means to have enough. It means sufficient. Now, I want to rest my case right here. And I want you to listen carefully and don't misquote me. The physical sufferings of Jesus were not sufficient. It was the offering of his soul. It was when God saw the travail of his soul that he said, I'm satisfied. The whole Bible teaches it. Peter on the day of Pentecost said so, and death itself couldn't hold him. He said God released him from the pains of death. Not possible that death should hold him any longer. Why? Because he had paid what he had vowed 
and God was satisfied in the offering of his soul for the sin of the world. God said when he saw the travail of his soul, I'm satisfied. It is enough. It is more than sufficient. And he released him from the pains of death and raised him in glory and seated him in his right hand. And all oh, here's the wonderful part for me and for you. God is satisfied with the offering of the soul of Christ. And I want you to know tonight that I am satisfied too. This is the way of salvation. It is to believe that God is satisfied in Jesus and for you to be satisfied in him too. Are you satisfied? Now listen. Do you believe in your heart tonight, down deep in your heart where no one but you and God can see, are you satisfied that that offering Jesus made for you is enough? You'd be surprised how many people are not. They believe it's important, but they don't believe it's enough. They're afraid it's not enough. They say, what if it isn't? Don't you think I should join the church? Don't you think I should be baptized? Don't you think I should do some works? Don't you think I should do this or do that or go here or go there? Believe this or believe the other. Believers believe that the offering of Christ's soul is sufficient. This is all our hope and all our peace. It is nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all our righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I go to eternity believing that his soul's offering is enough. God's satisfied with it. And if he's satisfied with it, I must come in my hands, no price I bring. If God is satisfied, there is nothing to pay. If God is satisfied, there is nothing to do. If God is satisfied, there is nothing to say. If God is satisfied, he's satisfied now and forever. And if he's satisfied, the only thing left for us to do is thank him, praise him, love him, and give him the glory. This is the reason men are saved by grace, through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should look. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for this message and for thy word. Thank you for this precious lamb this sin-bearing lamb, this suffering lamb, and this satisfying lamb. Thank you, Father, we have seen him in Isaiah tonight. Bless this message to our hearts and thy glory. Convict those who are unsaved to rest in Jesus. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Lord bless you.